chapter 12. Tonight we are observing the Lord's Supper, and tonight I just want to teach, I guess, more than preach, I guess it is. Uh, basically, where does the Lord's Supper come from? Why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper? What's the picture involved here? So notice Exodus chapter 12. We're going to read several verses here in this chapter. And then we'll go to Matthew for uh, several verses, Psalms, and we'll finish in 1 Corinthians tonight. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. The children of Israel have been slaves in Egypt, and God has brought just some amazing plagues upon Egypt to show Pharaoh who God is. Uh, when Moses first came to Pharaoh, Moses and Aaron, and they said, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. What did Pharaoh say? He said, Who is the Lord? He, didn't, he, he said, I don't know who the Lord is. I, I'm not going to listen to him. Well, by the time God was done, Pharaoh knew who the Lord was. He sent plague after plague after plague upon Egypt. Well, the very last plague he sent uh, is found in Exodus chapter 12, and it was the death of all the firstborn in Egypt. And by the way, it wasn't just those in Egypt, the, just the Egyptians. It was anyone in the land of Egypt, if they did not have the blood of the lamb over the doorposts, uh, on the doorposts and over the lintel of the door, the firstborn in that home would die. And so as we read through this, understand there's a picture God has painted here uh, of Jesus Christ uh, way back in Exodus. I mean, the whole Bible centers on and points to Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus' death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, that wasn't plan B. That's been God's plan from the very beginning. The Bible says he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So in Exodus 12, we come to the, the institution of this feast called the Passover. So notice Exodus 12:1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count. For the lamb, your lamb shall be without blemish. Jesus is the sinless lamb of God. A male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter, bitter herbs they shall eat it. And why is it unleavened bread? Because leaven is a picture of sin. So he said unleavened bread. There's to be no leaven in the bread. Uh, unleavened bread. Notice uh, verse uh, 9. He says, Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand. He's saying, get ready to travel. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Lord, speak to our hearts tonight. As we study your word, as we observe this, your supper, Lord, I pray that we'll understand the meaning behind it. And Lord, that we won't just um, turn to this as a ritual, but Lord, that we will truly examine our own hearts, that this will be a night to remember for us to be 100% right with you. Lord, that if there's anything in the way, anything between us and you, that we'll get it right with you tonight. Lord, if we have anything between us and another believer, may we get it right tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 12, he says, uh, that when I, or verse 13, rather, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. There's a song we sing, chiefest of sinners, Jesus will save. All he has promised, that he will do. Uh, come to the fountain, oh, I'm, I'm mixing up the verses now. Come to the fountain, open for sin. Uh, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. It's a great song anyway, but I'm not remembering it greatly. But uh, when I see the blood, he said, I will pass over you. When you take the blood of the lamb, you put it on the doorpost, you put it on the lintel, I'll see the blood, the death angel will pass over, and you will escape the judgment. And just again, think of that picture, the blood over 
the lintel and on the doorpost. It's just like Jesus hanging on that old rugged cross for us, the blood-stained cross. And notice what he says, verse 13. He says, And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. That only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in the selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing leavened in all your habitations, Shall ye eat unleavened bread? Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. Again, why is it called a Passover? Because the death angel would pass over when he saw the blood. Verse 22, And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood. Basically two branches. Take it, dip it in the blood of the lamb that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. As long as you're inside the house where the blood is covering it, you're safe. Verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door. And will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee. And to thy sons forever. Well, the children of Israel practiced. They did come out of Egypt. You can read the rest of chapter 12. They came out of Egypt. God gave them great deliverance. The Egyptians thrust them out. Pharaoh thrust them out. The firstborn in Egypt died. But those who had the blood over the doorpost or on the doorpost and over the lintel of the door, they lived. The death angel passed over. Well, the children of Israel celebrated that for hundreds of years. And fast forward to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus sits down with his disciples for what we have called the Last Supper, they are celebrating the Passover. This that, uh, that the children of Israel had done for, for generations, Jesus is now about to show the, the meaning behind this Passover. It's more than just about the death angel passing over the houses in Egypt. It's more than just about uh, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt as slaves. What it's about is the salvation of all mankind, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, giving his life for the sins of the world. And this is what he explains to the disciples. Matthew 26, verse 17. It says, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man. And say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now you need to understand about the Passover. A father in a home, he would have three pieces of unleavened bread wrapped in linen napkins. He would take the centerpiece. He would break the centerpiece. Now, folks, this is amazing. This, this is, the children of Israel have been doing this for hundreds of years. He would take that centerpiece and break the centerpiece, and that centerpiece is what the family would eat. He would then take the other part of the centerpiece and wrap it in that linen and hide it. Some would literally hide it under the table. Others would go put it in the house, and it became a game for the children to find, and there was a prize if they found it. These are, these are just little, little things they did for, for centuries. 
Now I want you to think about that middle piece of bread. Who is the bread of life that came down from heaven? Jesus Christ. Who was the middle man on the cross? Jesus Christ. His body was broken. It was buried in a tomb. He rose again and he's alive and coming again. And right here, uh, he is telling them as he's getting ready to break his body, uh, break the, the bread, uh, notice what he says in verse, uh, verse uh, 24. He says, The Son of Man goeth as it is written uh, of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been better, good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it. So he didn't just take any bread. He took that centerpiece of bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. And what is this? This is the new wine, the fresh wine of the vine. It's, it's not fermented at all. Why? It's picturing the perfect, pure blood of Jesus Christ. And notice what he says to them, verse 28, For this is my blood. Now, we're used to that verse, but when the disciples heard it, they've been thinking of these, uh, of these rituals they've been going through for years. And Jesus is telling them there's a purpose behind this Passover. This bread is representing my body. This cup is representing my blood. Verse 28, it's my blood of the New Testament, the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. Verse 29, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. What hymn did they sing? Victory in Jesus? No, they didn't sing that. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine? No. He lives? No, they didn't sing that. Turn to Psalm 118 if you would. What they would have sung, this is the very end. I'm not going to read the entire hymn they would have sung. But Psalm 113, all the way through Psalm 118, is what they would have sung. And uh, I want you to go there, please, and notice this. It's called a Hallel, or it's a song of praise. And so if you get time, you should take time tonight. Go home, read Psalm 113, 118, and picture the disciples there. Jesus has kept the Passover with them. He's broken that middle piece of bread. He tells them, listen, this is more than just unleavened bread. This is more than just about Egypt hundreds of years ago. This bread is my body, which is broken for you. This cup, drink ye all of it. This cup is my blood, the new covenant, the new testament. And as they sing in him, what are they singing? They're singing Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. Again, go home and read that and picture that. But I want you to notice just the end of the song. Look at Psalm 118. Notice verse 19. And again, put yourself there. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross to bear the sins of the whole world. And listen to what they're singing. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee. For thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refuse is become the headstone of the corner. They've been singing this hymn. And who is that stone that the builders refuse? It's Jesus Christ. Verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We sing that song as about every day. And truly, every day is made by God. Every day we can rejoice, we can be glad in it. But folks, God had a specific day in mind when he wrote those words. What day did he have in mind? The day his only begotten son would give his life on Calvary. The day his only begotten son would rise from the grave for our sin, for our salvation. This is the day. This has been God's plan from the foundation of the world. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Remember the story, the triumphal entry when Jesus was entering Jerusalem and the, the disciples were quoting this verse. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us, save us now. They thought he was coming to save them from the Romans. He was actually coming to save them from sin and death and hell and Satan. Verse 26, blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Verse 27, God is the Lord, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords. 
even unto the horns of the altar. We read the book of Hebrews, we find out Jesus is that sacrifice. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So all along when they're singing of this sacrifice, who's the sacrifice they're singing about? Is this some lamb? No, the lamb, the lamb of God. Verse 28, thou art my God and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And Jesus and his disciples went out. And we know the story. Jesus was betrayed and then uh, delivered up to be crucified. And he hung on that cross naked and shamed and pained and beaten for our sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and he rose again. And so when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are celebrating the fact that Jesus is that lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When we approach the Lord's Supper, and let's turn to 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to finish here with the preaching, and then we'll observe the Lord's Supper. When we approach the Lord's Supper, we need to take this as much more than just a ritual. Um, say, how often are we supposed to do the Lord's Supper? Well, Jesus told us, as oft as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. He didn't tell us how often to do it. And around here, we do it about every two to three months or so. I want to do it so, uh, I don't want to do it so often that it just becomes a ritual, that it just becomes something we do mindlessly as a, as a habit. On the other hand, I want it to be often enough that it serves its purpose. There are several purposes behind why we are to observe the Lord's Supper. And let me remind us again that when we observe this tonight, the bread does not literally become the body of Jesus. Jesus' body was sacrificed for us long ago. This fruit of the vine, which is uncorrupted, it's not alcoholic wine. Why? Because Jesus' blood is not corrupted. It does not literally become the, the blood of Jesus Christ. It is a picture of the blood of Jesus Christ. Just as next week, there are at least two I know of who are following the Lord in baptism. When they get in the baptistry and get in the water, there's a picture there of how Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose again. And when they get baptized, they're not getting saved. They've already been saved because of what Jesus did for them on the cross and how he was buried and rose again. But that pictures salvation. Well, the same is true with our observing of the Lord's Supper. As we approach this tonight, we need to approach this with a, a, a mindset of holiness and a mindset of sanctity when we come to the Lord's Supper. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There were problems in the church at Corinth regarding the Lord's Supper, which again was the Passover Jesus was celebrating with his disciples and that he told us to continue to observe. Notice chapter 11, verse 17. He said, Now in this, that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. The Lord's Supper ought to be something that brings blessing. It's something that ought to bring uh, honor to God. It's something that should be a spiritual renewal for us. But he was saying to the church at Corinth, when you're coming together, it's actually worse when you come together. Notice why uh, it was worse. There were problems in the church at Corinth regarding the Lord's Supper. The first problem was there were divisions among the believers. Verse 18, he says, For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. People were at one another's throats instead of loving one another in the spirit of Christ. There was division. And let me say this tonight. If you're not right with your brother and sister in Christ, you're not right with God. If you're not right with your spouse, you're not right with God. You have to be right this way to be right this way. And so as we approach the Lord's Supper tonight, uh, it, we need to look at our own human relationships. Do you have a human relationship that is out of whack, one that is not right with, uh, with someone else and not right with God? Uh, notice verse uh, 19, he says, For there must be also heresies among you. There was heresy among them. 1 Corinthians 15, there were some saying there was no resurrection. Well, there was a resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead. There's no gospel without the resurrection. But there was heresy in the church, particularly re regarding the gospel. There was heresy. There was false doctrine. Then notice verse 20. He says, when ye come together, therefore, into one place. This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. And one is hungry and another is drunken. There was drunkenness in the church. So they weren't coming together for the right purpose for the Lord's Supper. They were coming together to feast. And the poor who didn't have any food, they were watching others get drunk. It was a very carnal church. Then notice what else was there. There was despising. Verse 22, what? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? They were not honoring God's house. They weren't honoring 
God's people and his work. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And then there was also debauchery in the church. And we saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Open sin being allowed, a man living in open fornication. Now notice what the purposes behind the Lord's Supper are. Look at verse 23. What were the purposes? Why, were we, why are we still to observe the Lord's Supper? Is it to celebrate when Israel came out of Egypt? No. We're celebrating Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And notice what he says, verse 23. The first, pur first purpose of the Lord's Supper is to remember the price that Jesus paid. Uh, notice, do it in remembrance of him. Verse 23, he says, For I have received of the Lord that which uh, also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. The first reason we're to observe the Lord's Supper is to remember the price Jesus has paid. You know, if you go a whole week and not one time think about Jesus, folks, we need to stop and give some heavy thinking to the price Jesus paid for what he has done for us. I don't ever want it to get old to us, the gospel. And by the way, I'll say again, if it has gotten old to you, go find somebody new to tell it to, and that will freshen it up for you all again. But when we come to the Lord's Supper, we're to be remembering Jesus. Our minds shouldn't be wandering to, to dinner or to the ball game or, or to, hey, works tomorrow. Our focus needs to be on the Lord Jesus Christ, remembering what he has done for us. And notice the next purpose, uh, verse 26. He says, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. When we observe the Lord's Supper, we're demonstrating, again, his death. It's a picture, just like when folks get baptized, they're demonstrating what Jesus has done for them, how he paid the price. When we observe the Lord's Supper, we're demonstrating his death, his body that's been broken for us, his blood that's been shed for us, and we're remembering that he is coming again. He is returning. The Bible says, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. That reminds us that we're going to stand before him someday. We're going to give an account of our lives to him. And then notice the next purpose, and this is what I want us to focus on just briefly here, but verse 28 uh, verse 27, rather, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So when we approach this, this is to be a somber time. I, I like to joke and cut up from time to time. This isn't the time for that. This is a time to be somber. This is a time to be serious. This is a time for introspection. Um, this is a time, as I've said many a time, to draw a circle around yourself and ask, is this person right with God? This is not a time that the Bible doesn't say we're to examine one another. We're not to look at others and say, are they right with God? No, verse 28, we're to examine ourselves. As, the da as David, the psalmist said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. When we approach the Lord's Supper, it's to examine ourselves. Verse 28 says, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. As we're serving the Lord's Supper, there's a time where music will play. And what that time is for, it's not just because we don't have anything else to do. That time is for introspection. That time is for examining. That time is for prayer, saying, Lord, is there anything in my heart, anything in my life that needs to be taken care of? What does the Bible say? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we come to that time of examination, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts to see if there be any wicked way in us, and we need to deal with it right now. This is the night to do it. This is the night to take care of it. And then notice, uh, he says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I've heard people say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm not right with the Lord, so I'll just skip the Lord's Supper. That's not what God wants. What God wants is to bring us to that point of repentance. I'm talking to his people, our believers. He wants us to come to that point of repentance where we make things right. We don't skip it. We say, you know what, I'm going to get right the things I need to get right so I can observe the Lord's Supper with a clear conscience. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now notice, there are penalties. There are. There's, there's chastening. If we approach the Lord's Supper unworthily, if we, uh, if we take it flippantly, if we don't treat it 
uh, with the respect it deserves, thinking of Jesus' body and Jesus' blood, there are, there are penalties. There is chastening of the Lord. And again, one of the sure ways we know we are God's children is through his chastening, his discipline. So notice some of the problems the church at Corinth was experiencing because they were eating and drinking unworthily. Verse 29 says, For he that it eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Think of judgment, chastening. We're not talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about judgment from our heavenly Father. Uh, we're talking about chastening. If we eat and drink unworthily, we're eating and drinking damnation to ourselves, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Speaking of the sleep of death. Remember in 1 Corinthians 5, the man who was living in open sin, what did Paul say? He said, deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. There, there are, there's chastening. If we approach this unworthily, if we approach this without seriously getting right with the Lord, without seriously saying, Lord, is there anything in my life that isn't right? Physical problems and then even, as he said here, death. Uh, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 16, and it's speaking of brothers, those who are saved, it says there is a sin unto death. You know, if, if a child of God persists in sin and persists in sin and persists in sin, God will chase and he'll chase and he'll chase, and, but eventually he may just call someone home. The fact is that we need to observe this Lord's Supper with the idea that we are going to make everything in our power possible right with the Lord. Notice he says, verse uh, 30, again, this, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. For if, here it is, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If we will deal with things as God shows them to us, God won't need to. If we'll correct it, you know, sometimes parents, what do you say to kids? Hey, fix that. Straighten it up. Fix that. Correct it. What are you saying? What you're saying is you figure it out. You straighten it up before I have to. That's what you're saying. And that's what God is saying to us. If we would judge ourselves, and that's what we ought to be doing every time. We hear the word of God. We read the word of God. We hear it taught. We should be examining ourselves and saying, Lord, is there anything in me that needs to change? Is there any correction needed? If so, Lord, I want to correct it now. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. We, don't, we won't need chastening if we'll correct it ourselves. Notice he says, verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Again, a sure sign that we are children of God. We are chastened of the Lord. Why? That we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. When we approach the Lord's Supper, it ought to be a blessing to us. It ought to be something that causes us joy, that reminds us of the price our Savior paid for us. And it ought to be a time of refreshing and revival and renewal, a time we get things right. If there's anything, anything in your heart not right with God, now's the time. Now's the time. Let's bow our heads together, please. I'm not going to give an altar call, so to speak, where you walk to the front, though you can, certainly. But even right where you sit as we get ready to observe the Lord's Supper, in your own heart, are there, are there things that you need to yield to the Lord? Are there matters in your own life? Listen, now is not the time to examine someone else. Now is the time to examine yourself. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Examine yourself. Is there anything between you and the Lord? Get it right. Is there anything between you and a brother and sister in Christ? Get it right. So we might observe the Lord's Supper and be a blessing. Lord, thank you for your word. Help us to remember the things we've heard tonight. Lord, I pray that as we approach this, your Lord's Supper, Lord, that we will take it seriously. And Lord, that you will show us, that you'll reveal to us anything in our lives that isn't right, anything that needs to be dealt with. Help us, Lord, show us clearly that we might yield it to you. We want to be right with you. We're reminded that we're demonstrating your death until you come. You are coming again. We are going to give an account to you. So, Lord, help us to make sure we're right with you tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23.